Go. Oh, good day, everybody. Good day. How is everybody today? Again, always rushing, aren't we, Louise? Always rushing. Ah, aren't we, Louise? Say hello. Yes, hello. Okay, so we just want to know about how our um, whether you can see us and also whether you can hear us. Uh, so, Louise, you want to say a few more things? It's my birthday this <laughs> week. <laughs> it is Louise's birthday this week. I just had to say it, didn't you? I was, I was going to try and make it a bit of a surprise. That's why I deleted some of the messages. Can you see the messages on the... Um, yeah. You can, I, can, you can see the messages. I've deleted what them. What messages? Exactly. Like I, yes. Yeah. I, I, you can see the messages. Yeah. Oh, I thought I, I said I, I deleted them. Tim, I'm supposed to know how to do this. No, I've seen them all. Oh. Thank you all. You're very kind. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's as if you don't know. It's Louise's birthday. This came in Saturday. How old, how old would we be, Louise? That's a bit of a rude question to ask a lady. Ask a lady. Um, yeah. So it's uh, Louise's uh, <coughs> birthday. Uh, this came in Saturday. Um, it is a bit of an awkward time for us, isn't it? Because we are on a lockdown. Well, yeah. It's well... Ish. It's not the same as the lockdown that we had before in no. that we are in the house and can't come to work. No. But yeah. Yeah, we, we can't leave the borough. But we can be together. No. So I've had birthdays that really sucked, but this one won't, even though we can't go out. No, oh, you are kind. And of course, I had my birthday as well, just before lockdown, but I celebrated it from the summer house, didn't I? Are we all on? Can you just pop onto the... Um... Um, on the, I can't see on my screen here. Oh, oh sorry. That's okay. I got a cool. Because it's my birthday. It's your birthday. birthday. <laughs> it's Louise's birthday. <laughs> oh my goodness me. So can everybody see? I'm not quite sure whether everybody can see. Can we say something image attracted? No one's coming on saying that they can see us. Oh, they, oh, oh, oh yes they can. Ah, there we go. So can everybody hear us? You can hear us both. Cool. That's exactly what we're after. Uh, there we go. Yes. Okay, so we, um, before I start the question and answer, uh, two things, two things I just want to put out there beforehand, okay? So thank you, Romy, thank you, David, thank you, Lynn, yes, 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 happy birthday, happy birthday, Louise Berry, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so but before we go any further, there's two things I want to just quickly talk about. Um, I put a post out on uh, Facebook, on the At The Bench Facebook page, about a post that I had put, um, a film that I had put on At The Bench. And it was, it was this, it was regarding this ring here. Let me see if I can just zoom in on this. And I'd be interested to hear, here we go, hear your uh, comments on it. It's a, a silver band that's been made up. It's uh, got a bit of a hammered effect to it, as you can see. Got a bit of a hammered effect. It's um, adjustable, still in silver, not hallmarked, just hammered. Okay, there was um, a lady who put something on one of the Facebook groups in the week saying that she was wearing this ring. Uh, a friend wants her uh, to make one for her. How much should she charge? Okay, so that got me into a really interesting thought one evening. Um, how much should I charge for something like this? Uh, there's lots of variables to come into it. If you click on the um, the link on the Stream Deck, Louise, it will go straight to the post. If you click on it, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Keeping so, happy birthdays. <laughs> sorry to bring my birthday back into it. <laughs> so on the page now, there is a link to Facebook, to the At The Bench. It'll take you to that post. I'll show it to you again. It is a sterling silver hammered band. It is made like that. People who are members of At The Bench have seen the first film on how I made this ring up. Um, the ring took me 13 minutes, and I'll give you a bit of a clue, 13 minutes for me to make this ring up. So I wanna know, post up on the Facebook page, don't paste it up here on the chat on the YouTube, because no one will know what you're on about. So click on the link that Louise will put on there again Nice. Click on that link and it will take you to Facebook and I want you to put down in the comment section how much you would pay for a handmade sterling silver hammered ring. No hallmark and there's lots of variables and I'd be interested to know how much you would pay for it because 
this week there's another film going out, I haven't finished recording it yet, regarding pricing and how much I would charge for this ring and how much somebody else would charge for the ring, say if they were making the jewellery from their, say their garden shed or from their, uh, from their kitchen. That's one thing I was just going to chat about. The other thing, if you want to, there's still time, if you want to be in with a chance of winning this book by uh, Mathieu Cheminet and it's all about the art of stamping. We in focus just about, there we go. Um, you can go to YouTube and again Louise is going to push that button and on there is the film that will enable you to enter a competition to win this book. It's a fantastic gorgeous gorgeous book all about the art of stamping. Um, I do, let me just come out of that camera because it's a little bit on the close side. It's an absolutely brilliant brilliant gorgeous book. I've been in touch with Tim McCrete the uh, owner of Bryn Morgan Press and he said that he will happily post out one of these books to a winner from a competition that we are running on YouTube. So click that link, come up there. Mike, you should be able to see the link. The link should be coming up. So those are two things that I wanted to get up and out of the way. So today is the 14th of September. It is time for a question and answer. And it is pretty hot in this room, isn't it, Louise? It's getting hotter. Oh, you're right. You're cool. You're cool. Cause it's your birthday by any chance? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Didn't want to bring it up again. <laughs> oh, okay, so, so before we go any further, uh, Jane, did you hear back from Jim Lloyd? Yes, I did. It was my phone. I did, I did find back from Jim about the stamps. I'm glad you reminded me because I've forgotten for the last two weeks. I will tell you now before we go any further. Um, so it's called, if you can just search for this please, Louise, infinitystamps.com, infinitystamps.com. Okay, so they, oh you're a fantastic typer. Shut up. <laughs> infinitystamps. You're watching me. Infinitystamps.com, okay? So that is the website you wanna to go to. And on that page, there is a system called TagMate, T-A-G-M-A-T-E, okay? And that is the system that Jim and Lolly um, have actually invested into. Tag stamp. It's TagMate, that's it, TagMate. It should be done to TagMate under infinity stamps. Nope. There we go, oh, that TagMate test. There we go, TagMates. There are all TagMate caps, TagMate stamp base. There we go. So that's, if you copy that, mm -hmm. cool. So Louise is just gonna post that into the chat. That is the system that my good friend Jim Lloyd and his wife Lolly um, have got. And it is really, really good. Okay, so I think it's time for our question and answer. 14th of September, it's Monday. We are back in the recording studio workshop, so we should not have any interruptions from customers because Jason is back downstairs along with um, Sharon. And Jason did have his COVID test, and yes, he is negative. Hence the reason why he's back downstairs. So anyway, Louise. No more malingering for Jason. No more being up here on his phone. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe have our first question, please, Louise. Yes. Um, Jessica is saying, for rings with lots of tiny stones in claw settings, is it unusual for this style to be fabricated by hand versus cast? Um, I think it depends upon the number of settings. It's always nice to be able to fabricate something completely by hand, but I think that does come a limitation um, as to what you're going to be able to charge for that piece, for that one-off piece completely fabricated everything by hand. You know, the upper bezels, all the claws, clusters. If you're making a silver ring, it really isn't gonna be worth it. If you're making it in, say, nine carat, the time involved in, in making that ring is gonna be really um, not worth it because the time involved is gonna far um, outweigh the, the, the cost of the, the piece really. So those pieces then are usually made up in 18 karat or platinum. Nice to be able to fabricate something up by hand. But if you are going to be producing um, just the one copy and you want to be able to use cast 
components, but then you can always have them and bring them into your piece to be able to put something together that'd be very nice. And if you're making quite a few pieces, yes, make up the one by hand or use your cast pieces to make up the master. And from that master, then you can get multiples made from the lost wax casting process. So what was the question again? Um, is it unusual for this stand to be fabricated it, it versus is. Hand, it, by hand versus cast? It, it is unusual, but if you consider fine jewellery, diamonds, emeralds, rubies, sapphires, really nice expensive stones, tanzanites, something handmade is going to be well worth it into 18 carat and platinum. So it's, it, it is unusual. Did I just say it's unusual? I contradict myself. You said it is unusual, yeah. It is unusual, yes, because the majority... Because it's not the usual to be loved, but anyway, thank you, Louise. That's what I'm singing. Right, now, okay, so there we go. Next question, please, Louise. Um, right, Janet. Um, when plaiting or twisting silver or copper wire for bangles or rings, how do you calculate the initial pieces of wire? Initial pieces of wire. So as to obtain desired and length, desired and sorry, I'm a kind of right pig's ear of this. <laughs> when plaiting or twisting silver or copper wire for bangles or rings, how do you calculate initial pieces of wire so as to obtain desired end length before making waste. plaiting to avoid too much waste? waste. Yep, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there is really a formula because I think what you've got to take into consideration is the thickness of the metal. Um, how many twists, how tight those twists are. Because remember, the more twists, the shorter the piece of metal will become. Are you going to leave it like that? Are you going to flatten it? Are you going to hammer it? If you're going to hammer it, the metal will spread as well as go a bit longer. But if you're going to put it through the roller mill, it'll purely get longer. So there's lots of things you've got to take into consideration. Years ago, we used to make so many twisted bangles. It was, it was unbelievable. And we used to allow for, because, because it, we used to do gold bangles and we used to have them to melt either end to hold the wire together. So we used to add on 10 millimeters onto the length to allow for melting it down. Then we used to work out, well, how tight is this twist? If it's a really loose twist and you were not going to flatten it, you would perhaps make it say 10 millimeters longer. This is bangle wise. You know, this is like 20 and a half millimeters. So say your bangle length had to be 20 and a half. You had 10 mil for this end, 10 mil for that end. So that's 22 and a half. You're down about 10 millimeters end for a loose twist, perhaps 15 or 20 millimeters for a tight twist if you were leaving it. But if you were rolling it out, you did not necessarily have to add the extra for the twists because as you twisted it, it got shorter, but then as you rolled it, it got longer. So there was lots of things to take into consideration, depending on how much you roll it. Obviously you roll it to uh, half its thickness, it's gonna go virtually half the length longer and so forth, but also spreads. So don't think there is an actual formula, but the more times you do it, the more times you're gonna be able to get it just right. But if you're rolling it out after you've twisted it, you can always roll it that little bit further to get the right length or not roll that out enough just to, to, to not bring it back. But do you know what I mean? You roll it out enough just to make the required length for the twists to come along to actually um, get the joint exactly right. But someone just said, use copper. If you're using two millimeter silver, use two millimeter copper, practice it add the lengths on and see how it all comes out. But then at the end of the day, the metal is never wasted because you always have these little bits of silver that you do cut off that you can always use, send back to the refiners, you can melt down for some casting or melt down for some embellishments. Next question, please, Louise. Julius, Gillian is saying try it in copper first. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, Mandy is asking, is it okay to water quench? Am I missing some of this? Is my thing gone a bit narrow? No. Is it okay to water quench torch colour titanium or should I let it air dry? Um, I would, I've never done an awful, I haven't done an awful lot in titanium. Did an awful lot when I was um, a lot younger, when I was in university. And we just simply, if you heated it, you just let it cool. Um, naturally because titanium will um, cool down quite quickly. If you don't quench it, um, you will always know to stop a little bit before because when you take your torch off, the colouring will continue slightly. So you'd always have to get, just sort of 
just is it virtually there virtually there torch off and then the pattern actually sort of gets there so for me i wouldn't put it in the water um, there may be something in the water that may actually affect the uh, titanium maybe a little bit of acid or something like that so i wouldn't risk it i would just purely heat it up with a torch get into the habit of just stopping like a quarter of a second before the actual color gets to where you want it or the right color gets there and you remove your torch it'll carry on heating that fraction and just get the right color or to the place where you want to go <laughs> next question please louise okay isabel is asking how would you make a simple brooch pin Mm, ah, dear. Ooh, ah, I got different colours today. I've got red, green, berry. blue, and red. So in Welsh, this is called koch. This is red. I know the yeah koch. Yeah, okay. yeah. This is called glass. It's blue. This one's green and this one's black. Hang on, okay. what's green? So, what, do you know, I, come on, if you've got all I the can't, answers. I can't remember what green, are you looking, you're looking at it now. I know it, I'm just checking. <laughs> what is it with this green? It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, green colour. Gurth. Gurth. No it's, cheating, don't look. It's gurth, green. I know what black is. Black. I don't even have to cheat at black. Nero. Oh, no, <laughs> um. Is it the or D? D, D, isn't it? D, Double D, D, the. D, the. So it's the. Okay. Right. Anyway, go back anyway, to your yeah, brooch. Go back to your brooch pin. What I would. It depends. Which is all very well saying how do you make a brooch pin, but actually it depends upon the fitting, the hinge that your brooch pin is going into. Oops, I haven't got my light on. So sometimes what you'll find is I've got none of my lights on. No, come on, come on. Um, none of my lights are on. There we go. Let's put a green behind there. So. It depends on the hinge and depends if you need it sprung. <laughs> so if you need it sprung in one way, the easiest way is to get your wire and then go around and around like that. So you have a bit sticking down like this here. So then this acts as the bit of the spring. So then your wire would go through here. And if the brooch uh, fa fastening is here, there it is here. This is the hinge, oh, oh different color. The green, the girth, girth, is your hinge here. There's your hole. And this little bit down here acts as that bit of a spring. So you can always put the pin up here like this, like that. So the pin's up there. So when you push the pin downwards this way, it's going to act against this little area here against the brooch, which is going to give it just that little bit of springiness. Can you all see that? Let me just zoom in on this so you can see. There we go. All right. Understand that? Cool. Right. The other way to do it would be to, this is, this is quite a nice little bit of a trick. What you want to do is get a strip of metal and this, from this metal, we're going to make up our hinge and also the tongue that goes in between. You bend that now into into that okay so you bend it around and around and around like that so then this is your metal like this okay so you make like a rub, a flat jam roll Ooh, food <laughs> food <laughs> you obviously just have it the right depth that you need for what you've got okay so this then this part here is now going to be a hinge this part here is going to be a tongue you squash that together so they are really next to each other okay so they're really really tight against each other then what you do then is file that off there so once you file that off there this little piece here is going to be the tongue so that's your piece of metal that is over here now and what is left here is going to be your hinge. Okay, that's going to be your hinge now because this gap in the middle is the same thickness as this because this has just come out of the middle. And from that then you solder on your pin on top of that. Okay, then what you can do is depending on where you want to turn it upside down so this is this shape. OK, 
Okay, so it could be that shape. You put this in, back inside there. You then drill a hole through here, and that will go through there at the, at the same time. You make a little bit of a U shape like that on the bottom, like that. You solder that onto your brooch fitting, whatever it is, like this, and then you. Is that your stomach, Louise? It was, yeah. <laughs> I've been talking about cake. <laughs> Okay, so I hope all this makes sense to you now. So you then have just fabricated a hinge like that. So that goes into that, and then you've made a hinge. Complicated way of doing it, but that's, that's the correct way of producing. Or if you did it this way, and you could actually put that inside here, still drill a hole, and this edge then would be under here to act as the spring you had to. Does it all make sense? Really complicated. It's easier, sort of not done on the board, but actually shown. But that is the best way to produce a brooch pin. I'm sweating. Absolutely sweating. Okay, Louise, maybe we have our next question. Yes. Um, Romy is upgrading a goldsmith hammer. Is Brett's a good investment? And is their bench block also a worthwhile investment? So we have um, a frets hammer. Let me put my that to one side. So this is a nice, gorgeous frets hammer. It is a lovely hammer. It's got a lovely polished front here. It's got this one has got the cross pane. I love it. It's really nice. It's got a nice weight about it. It's nicely balanced. It's a nice piece of craftsmanship. Here is the bench block. Um, again, this is rather nice. It's a, a round frets bench pin. It's nice because it has little rubber feet on the bottom. A nice wooden base and a nice hard bit. Do I get better results from these? No, I don't. Because I have simply got a normal little steel cheap little block like this. Um, that I think is fine. It's, it's very adequate for what for what you need, because all you're doing is banging and hammering upon it, as long as you make sure that the surface is nice and shiny, and it's smooth and it's not full of dings, it's perfect. Nothing wrong with that against the frets. Um, the frets hammer, yes, I do like the hammer. It is nicely weighted. Uh, you can pick up other hammers, um, you know, cross pane hammer, ball pane hammers, really, really cheap. I don't find they're gonna be nice enough. They're ideal for bashing and for doing awkward things, and banging nails in or pins in, something like that. But if you wanna do some, some uh, say fold forming, something like this, or you wanna do some hammering or some nice planishing, I do find that the frets hammer then really does pay for itself because it does feel really nice in the hand and it's nicely, correctly weighted. Um, I do love my frets um, bench block, by the way. Um, it looks nice. And I think upon the shelf by here, I think it looks really nice. And that's where it's gonna go back up there because um, I just tend to use my little steel block, to be honest. So if you can afford them, go and buy them. There's nothing wrong with them at all. They are really nice quality tools. I know people say you should buy quality tools. Totally understand that because they're gonna last your lifetime. And yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, but for simply when you're doing some, some work and you're bashing and you're banging, something like a normal little bench block like that is gonna be just as good as something like this. But a hammer that you're applying the texture or the, the, the force with, I think it does pay. So yeah, buy the hammer. If you can afford it, buy the block. If not, just buy a normal little steel block. Uh, Next question, please. Okay, Robin is saying, I was setting a stone last week and the bezel snapped. I'm thinking I just kept at it for too long and stressed the joint, but could it have been something else? No light in the seam and looked fine. And it, when she was hammering it, sorry? Uh, setting stone and the bezel snapped. Hmm, okay, um, really hard, obviously, without seeing it and knowing the circumstances. Uh, if you're setting the stone, um, I presume you were perhaps rubbing it over. So you may have perhaps work hardened the joint 
perhaps the, the silver had been work hardened and it hadn't been annealed beforehand. So if the metal is really quite thin and it's being constantly moved back and forth, it will work out it, its way um, hard and it will fracture through the weakest point, which is going to be the solder joint. So perhaps it was because it was not annealed. Um, it just may not have been soldered or perhaps you quenched it too quick after you had soldered it. So although you didn't see it, perhaps there was a slight fracture within the joint and by moving it, it just came to the surface and cracked. So what I'd always suggest is once you've soldered something, never put it straight away into an acid or into water to quench. Wait, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 seconds, wait for it to cool down. Then you can pickle it, then you can put it in water or whichever way you want to do it. And that will help um, the joint not become fractured and you're not going to put any stress into the joint. So it sounds like for some reason or other the joint was stressed, so I'm not really quite sure. Uh, next question, please, Louise. Okay, how to fuse gold on finished silver jewellery so that it resembles painted with a brush, only with gold leaf technique? Yes. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Mokume, no, not Kengigani, what's it called? Kembu. Kembu. You need to do some Kembu, which is um, some uh, gold foil. I think gold leaf is going to be too thin. You want to get some gold foil, which is, a, which is a little bit thicker than gold leaf. You want to get, was it silver? You want to put it on top of silver. Yeah. So you get yourself like a hot plate, um, like where you, that you like when you're a single person in student accommodation, you just have a ring that you can warm your soup or your beans upon. It's electric hot plate. <laughs> What's the matter? Nothing. <laughs> right, what you want to do is get one of them, then you get your finished piece of silver. Um, you do have to make sure that the surface is absolutely perfectly clean with no oils, no greases, no tarnish, no nothing at all on it. You put the piece onto your little single hot plate, you heat it up. You then preferably get, will get an agate burnisher. Then you perhaps will cut out your design out of your gold foil. You get it with a pair of tweezers. When the silver is hot enough, you apply the foil on top of the silver that's on top of the hot plate. Get your agate burnisher and burnish it onto the silver and the burnishing action oh bless you oh, excuse me yes, bless you, okay. and then the, the, that action will then will cause cause a molecular bond between the silver and the foil itself um, not quite sure whether it has to be whether you actually have to quench it first i can't remember that may ring a bell because you've got to have some fine silver with some fine gold i think but agate burnisher and when it's hot enough you can burnish down on top and that will get an absolute Super, super, super. Um, I've actually done some of this in my cabinet. So whilst Louis is asking a nice long question, perhaps I'll go and get it and show you a little bit later. So yeah, it's called Chem Boo, if you want to go and check it out. We have done some films and after bench on it. So Chem Boo, brilliant. Next question, please, Louise. Okay, Scrap Over Engineering is saying, I bought hand burnishers and a set of setting punches. The tip of the burnisher is a bit sharp. Should I polish it into a smooth end? The same for setting punches, should I polish these? Uh, okay, um, definitely with your burnisher. Get some emery paper, make sure there's no marks. It's gotta be a mirror, mirror finish. So emery paper it, then you can get your flex shaft or a Dremel or bench mounted polishing motor with some calico mops just to give it a nice finish. Finish off then with rouge. If your burnisher is perfectly smooth with no snags, but a fantastic, fantastic finish, when you burnish, the fantastic finish is gonna be transferred from the burnisher onto the piece and you're gonna get a nice, nice shine. So definitely do that. Setting punches, not quite sure which punches, but no, I would not have setting punches or really any sort of punch that you use for tapping um, a bezel. I would never have that polished because that is likely to slip. There's no friction between the edge of the bezel and the punch. So always have the, um, the edge or the end of your setting punch 
So you know, say you have um, your bezel in a block and you've got a punch and you're just tapping over the edge, make sure the end of the punch is slightly rough. And that doesn't mean to say you get a file and file it and I mean that sort of rough, that's gonna be far too much. What you wanna do is get a little bit of emery paper and just go over the end. You don't wanna shine, you don't want it as bright as that because it will slip. And if the punch slips, it can easily damage the stone. So as long as you've got a little bit of resistance, from the matte finish that's on the end of the punch, that is all you need and you can just tap that around. So burnisher, definitely yes, high, high finish, setting punches, no slight resistance when you come to tap and you'll be well away. Next question, please, please. Sorry, just going back to Robin's question. Should have said snapped at the bezel seam and joined to the back plate in that spot. Right, okay. Um, yeah, if, if, you'd, if you have done a solder joint on the bezel and then you solder that bezel onto a, the back plate, perhaps the solder, and again, if you solder the bezel and you've cleaned all the solder off, then you wanna solder that bezel onto the back plate. Even if that bit of solder just becomes ever so slightly molten or anywhere near molten, because you've taken the rest of the solder off, let me show you this in a minute, I'll show you what I mean. So we're looking down on top of your bezel, okay? So this is looking down on top of your bezel. So this is your bezel here. Looking down on top and here is your joint here, okay? If You've soldered the bezel and you want, I want to make a nice, nice job on this. I want to make this a nice, nice bezel. And you have the joint just like that. And when you solder it, obviously you've got a little bit of solder. Let me, let me use red for solder. And then you've got a bit of solder on the outsides like this. Okay, and you go, oh, it's a bit ugly. I don't want that. I want to remove that solder. Okay, so you remove that solder, but we do have a bit of solder through the middle, like that there. I feel like uh, like, like Tony Hart here yeah? on Art Attack. Um, he was not Art Attack. Oh, he wasn't? Oh, no. like Vision On then. Right. That's, <laughs> that's showing my age. What's Vision On? Vision On. We'll come to that another, <laughs> another time. So once you've done that, okay, you've got, the, you've got no excess solder. You've got no solder. You've only got that bit of solder that just runs through the gap. You solder that bezel onto a back plate. If that bit of solder happens to become molten, what you'll get is this, um, an enlarged version of that joint, okay? And it's such in, so enlarged, you see a bit of solder. And what will happen, the solder will do that. And this is your solder. The solder will shrink slightly and come away from the joint, which will produce a weakness. So what you want to do is when you have your bezel here, you don't want to finish that joint up just yet before you solder it on, you wanna make sure that you leave a little bit of solder, perhaps on the inside and a little bit on the outside. So should you, you, you happen to melt that little bit of solder by soldering that bezel onto the back plate, and that solder is just coming over the joint like this, if that bit of solder starts to melt, it may just run, it may move, and because you've got this excess on either side, it acts as a bit of like a, like a reservoir and it fills up the joint a little bit more when it cools. So that could be the reason why. Extremely long winded. <laughs> so that could be the reason. Okay, Louise, may we have our next question, please? We have a question about Argentium, but we, that's we don't not really do something. So I do yeah, apologize, we don't I, do yeah, anything with Argentium. I have kind of already okay yeah, thank you for that, that we do. but yes um la, 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 la. happy birthday Louise. Happy birthday. <laughs> is it your birthday Louise? Yeah. this coming um, saturday happy birthday uh, okay marius um my question is is it a problem if i smelt different 925 silver jewelry and not purify the silver first uh okay this in order to reuse the metal um no you don't have to purify the metal, you can melt different 925s. The problem being is that we find there's a lot of fakes and copies and cheap jewelry out there that may be stamped 925, but it isn't 925. It's perhaps made in Eastern, Far Eastern countries that they make them cheap, they sell them on things like AliExpress or Wish, 
or whatever it is, Alibaba, whatever, but it really isn't silver. It's perhaps like it's a base metal, uh, they've copper plated it, they've chrome plated it, they stamp 925 on it, and everyone thinks it's silver. Some of it is silver, don't get me wrong, but some of it isn't. So you really got to be, pay a lot of attention when it comes to that. We are doing a film on At The Bench on using the acid Troy kits to be able to say what metal it is when you test it, whether it's silver, whether it's 9 carat, 14 carat, 18 carat and so forth. So that is a good way of, of telling what the metal is. Another good way of telling what, if it is really silver or if it's really perhaps chrome plated is on a, a part of the ring or part of the jewellery, get your blade and just run the blade across the edge of a piece of the, the, the ring or whatever. If it like, like just glides across without cutting, without, without uh, making a mark almost like a finger across a, a, a window, you know, it doesn't make any mark, just skates across it, it's gonna be something like chrome plated. If it is, walk away from it. Don't melt it down, just put it in your refiner bag, send it to the refiners, because nine times out of 10, something that is sort of chrome plated is not gonna be silver. But if when you pass your saw over the edge, it does bite and it does catch, it could well be silver. Again, if it's got 925, there's no guarantee that it is silver. If it's hallmarked from the United Kingdom or from Northern Ireland, um, it's guaranteed sterling silver 925, so you can melt whatever you want to down then. But do take care when you are melting silver. Like I know Jason and I have bought in some what we think is silver in like a big bag. We just ooh, just go through it. Yeah, that looks okay. That looks okay. That looks okay. We put it to one side and then we go through it again. We find that there are some pieces that haven't been silver. So do take care. But yes, you can melt different 925s in one go. No problem at all with that. Maybe have a next question, please. Yes. Mark is saying, any advice on soldering balls onto coins for pendant and ring jewellery? Would silver solder work for most coins? Happy birthday, Louise. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, silver solder should work. Um, what also I would do is you've got, the, uh, you've got your coin. Um, get something like a a ball burr, something like that, and make it a slight little divot where you want the ball to go. It'll help you tremendously. The ball will be able to locate in there. What you want to do then, because then you've used the, the ball burr within the little area, this area out here is oxidized. This little area is beautiful and clean. Drop a borax or drop a flux in that little area there tiny snippet of solder, melt it in there. It's not gonna flow anywhere else because everywhere else is, is oxidized and tarnished, but that little area is nice and bright because you just cleaned it. You will melt then your tiniest little bit of solder within there. Then you come along then with the ball and the ball then will sit into there. You heat up it all and then when it gets to the right temperature, the ball will just settle down into the hole because the solder will melt and the solder will stay exactly where it should in that little divot and not go anywhere else because that is clean and this has been tarnished or oxidized from years wear. So yes, silver, little divots, help your balls stay in position. There we go. What's the next question, birthday girl? Oh, sorry, not your birthday yet, is it? It's, it's my it's birthday Saturday. week though, isn't it's, it? It's your birthday week, it's your birthday week. My birthday week. month. <laughs> Don't milk it now, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Gordo is saying, can you give me some advice on how to solder a fine gold chain without soldering five to six other links together also? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, uh, several methods of doing this. Uh, you can get a third hand like this, uh, and I would turn that the other way up so those are looking upwards like that. So these are upwards, okay then what you would do is just get it so you have, you've got your third hand sticking up like that. That's my third, it's not a very good third hand, is it? But you get the idea. And then what you would do is get your chain, you'd get your chain link here with the jointed up here, and you get the other chain links hanging down here. Then what you do then, you get your third hand in this area by here, so your third hand would come into place like that. Your third hand then would hold that area. Here's your link here. 
The third hand would hold the other links down here. The third hand will hold that one little link that is sticking up. So you then can solder here. This third hand then stops the rest of the chain getting too hot. There's a, there's a, there's a film on YouTube showing, showing a new, um, an alternative way of soldering. You never put the flame onto this. You always bring your flame up here. Okay, you never put the flame onto the joint. You use the heat that comes off the flame to come onto this area. Perhaps you may want to use some solder paste uh, or some syringe solder. That would be a really good way of doing that. Alternatively, you would get yourself a solder pick. Solder pick, you then would melt a small little bit of solder onto that pick tiniest, tiniest little bit of solder onto the end of the pick. You heat up the pick now. I spend too long drawing now, don't I? I'm trying to get these going well, don't I? So here now is my solder pick. Here is the little bit of solder on the solder pick here. And then here is the flame. And what I would do with the flame is put the flame onto the solder pick here to heat it up so as the heat travels to the end, the solder will just about melt and when it does bring that into contact with the link, the joint of the link, and the heat will transfer onto the end of the link and solder that one tiny little piece. But yep, yeah, so search on YouTube, I think it's called the alternative way to solder and I show you how to pick solder a link exactly as you need to. But by having it within your third hand, it stops all these um, from melting. The other way of doing it, if you've got yourself a I can't remember how these are drawn now. An old razor blade. Okay, you would use the razor blade, you put the razor blade over the links. So here's your chain coming underneath and you, it's, it's coming underneath on oh, the link just comes over here. Here's your link here, and here are your links underneath, underneath. So all that's exposed is the one link that you need to be soldered. The razor blade, or you could simply use just two pieces of copper with a chain running underneath and the one link exposed here, and then your chain runs underneath. As long as you're protecting the rest of the chain from the heat of the flame, you can do it that way with bits of copper on top of the chain, just leaving your link exposed, or with the it's like an old fashioned one, an old fashioned razor blade like that. You bring the flame in and because you've just got this little area exposed here, because the rest of the chain is completely hidden and away from the heat, you should be able to solder just that one link. But I feel far that's a little bit harder than using the pick soldering. But the pick soldering is an excellent way of doing it. There we go. Okay, Louise, may we have a next question? Yes. Um, David had a qu has a question on hallmarking. When it comes to the issue of getting um, hallmark for my silver pieces over seven grams, how can I get that done for items without having to register for one? Um, as in, that they want the hallmark applied onto their pieces, but they don't want to pay for a, a registration mark. Uh, doesn't want to. Doesn't want to have to register for one. I think you do have to register without having to register. How can mm. I get it done for items without having to register with one if the item's over seven okay. grams? Okay, you would have to approach somebody who does have their own hallmark and say, can you send it off on my behalf? I'm not quite sure whether that's a legal way of doing it, but that's a way of asking. And I think in the past, um, but I think you do have to register. But I remember sending up something to the assay office years ago and I didn't have a punch small enough to put onto a post of some earrings and the Birmingham assay office put their own BAO onto the posts. Now they did that, that's their stamp, not my stamp because I didn't have a punch or stamp small enough for the E wires. I don't know whether they would do that if you asked them to or whether you actually have to be registered for them to do it. I'm not quite sure. But the best thing to do would be to approach one of the assay offices, Birmingham, London, um, Edinburgh, 
Sheffield, whichever one is nearest to you, whichever one you want to go to, drop them an email and ask them, is there any way that you can have a hallmark applied onto a piece without actually registering your own um, initials, your own designs? I don't think you can do it myself, but it'd be interesting to find out if you could just let us know. Uh, next question, please, Louise. Okay, Mary is making an extra wide cuff bracelet, about 75 mil wide. Um, it will be 16 gauge sterling with a 30 mil by 75 mil by 4 mil rectangular bezel set, set cab on it. Yes. Yep. Yeah. What is the best way to solder the bezel to the cuff? Afterwards. You've got to bend the cuff first. There's no doubt about it. Um, you have to, if otherwise, the, if well, you, you don't have to, but ideally, when you have a cuff, why did I just draw it upside down? You get the general gist. Very weird, I just, just drew it upside down then. Okay, so um, this part of the cuff is always going to have a little bit of curvature. You have to solder your bezel on afterwards. You have to get the bottom of the bezel to match. I know I've exaggerated that a bit. You have to get the bottom of your bezel to match the cuff. That is the only way of doing it. Or what you'd have to have is your cuff like that, which would be flat like that. Then you could solder that on, but that has to be then perfectly flat to enable the bottom of the bezel to be soldered directly onto it. That's the only way, because if you soldered that bezel onto a flat piece of metal, then try to bend it, what's going to happen is your bezel is going to end up something like this, like that. And that is what will never do. Plus, it won't be perfectly oval because you're effectively pulling it into this shape, into this direction. And not only are you going to you may end up with like an oval, so the top of the oval would be like that, um, and the bottom of the oval maybe. It's just a weird, weird thing to do. So always make sure that you make the cuff first, then solder the bezel on once you've got the bottom of the bezel, the right curvature to fit the cuff. That's the only way you're going to do it successfully. Now, yes, yes, please, please. How would you get solder to flow successfully on this large piece of silver? That's still Mary, it's not me. Okay. I didn't ask an intelligent <laughs> question for once. <laughs> <laughs> How would you get this to, to flow? Mm. Um, you would heat it from underneath. You would get your... Cursed it, if I, if I rubbed it all off. <laughs> like that. So, yeah, you've got your, your bezels on the top of here, like that. What would I do? I would then rest the bezel on top of the... Um, the bangle, then I would get my torch in from underneath because you have to heat up this, all of this here, before this area here gets the right temperature. So I would perhaps um, stand the cuff up on um, a block like that or suspend it on two blocks so you can get your torch in from underneath. So perhaps you may want to get a block um, a charcoal block or a, or a block that side and a block that side just enable you to get your torch in up and under to the piece. Never really put the flame down on top because this little area of your bezel is going to be far far smaller than the bangle itself. That will melt before this has even got up to temperature. So you've got to be careful. Heat up the biggest area, heat up the biggest mass first and then you can sort of dance the flame around to get the bezel the correct temperature. Or just use the heat from the bangle going through onto the bezel. So once it's all the right temperature, it should solder quite nicely. Uh, and maybe have a next question, please. Yes. Go, oh. <laughs> Kevin is saying, can you get gallery wire with crown settings on left and right side? On a double sided. Um, woo, as in, as in, um, um, like that, as in, <clears throat> like that. So it's double sided, perhaps? I'm not quite sure. Yes, you can get it definitely on the one side. 
Can you get it on both sides? I don't know. I haven't looked into gallery why on both sides, because that'd be quite nice if you do in something like a spectacle setting. I quite agree. Um, don't know, don't know. Definitely on the one side, most bullion dealers will do them on the one side. Um, just have to have a look. I've never seen them myself, but then again, I haven't gone looking for them. So yeah, best bet would be to have a search for perhaps double-sided gallery wire. Perhaps we've got two seconds, Louise, when after you've stopped um, accepting all your, your birthday messages and reading your birthday Don't messages. Don't be jealous. <laughs> Can you have a look for, for, for double-sided gallery wire? Not now. You'll ask you the next, my next question now. <laughs> I'm only joking. You know I'm only joking, okay. don't you? I'm only joking. Please, maybe have our next question. But we're gonna we're gonna look for double-sided gallery wine now. If you ask, Louise is gonna be yeah. Okay, next question, please, Louise. <clears throat> okay, um, what are your tips for cutting jump rings? I have been noticing that my cuts are slanted, and I can't seem to straighten the cut, and that's polymer plate which it. Uh, okay, so it sounds like perhaps your saw blade is slightly. Can you just check for double-sided um, oh, yeah. gallery strip, please, please. Double-sided gallery strip. Um, so, what was the question? Come on, my, my brain's terrible, isn't it? Double-sided gallery wire. What was, oh. the, what was the question just now, Louise? <laughs> <laughs> what are your tips for cutting jump rings? Yeah, I jump rings, that's it, yeah, yeah. Rings, yeah. So it sounds like your blade is perhaps not cutting straight. Um, I think if, if you're cutting, a piece of metal. I, I don't know. I don't know why you the 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 saw cuts would be going to a different size. Perhaps you're holding them differently in your hand. Perhaps instead of cutting them straight, you try to turn them to the side, and you're cutting, and you're just cutting, and the pressure of cutting is in a different position. But if you perhaps have the the jump rings in the same position as you would when you're cutting a sheet it should be going nice and straight. If you try and move that coil sort of to one side and you try to cut them from the side, as I said, you may be cutting one side or the other side and the saw is wandering or it could be a duff blade, so I don't know. Did we find out about um, double-sided gallery wire? Yeah. And what was the answer, Louise? Yes, you can get it. Oh, okay. yes, you can get it. You can get double-sided gallery wire. Mm, yep. Awesome. Which is the, the one on the left-hand side. Down, that, down, down. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Burr House, Burr House. Well, I don't know any that's, of these suppliers, really, so I wouldn't. So Burr House, yeah. okay, Burr House is British, but that's so, like a, that's one that's already made up, I think, isn't it? Or yeah. have they made one up? Yeah. Heavy so, pendant dropper with double sided crown bezel sectioning or setting, sorry, fits two 12 mil cabochons. Okay, so it looks like you can get double sided. There's a company called Burr House, I think it's called burrhousebeads.com. They have settings already made up. Um, for them, but I don't know whether you can get it loose, but it seems like if they can make up the settings, it looks like you can. So burrhousebeads.com, check them out for double-sided gallery wire. Excellent, thank you Louise for that. Cool. You're very welcome. May I have our next question please? Yes. Here you go. Uh, we did the jump oh, rings, so, so going back to the clay, I just saw it mentioned up on there, doesn't the chain stick to the um, the saw blade, the, saw, to the, the copper or the, um, the razor blade, no it doesn't. Um, the, if, the only time that it would do was that if the flux happened to go, oh, wrong camera, there we go. So, so it, they, it wouldn't stick necessarily to the chain uh, because steel does not adhere itself to metal. If the solder flows onto the steel or the copper, yes it may fasten onto it, it may also fasten onto it if some of the flux gets caught between the two surfaces, but you can always quench that in some water just to release that. But you use the smallest amount of solder, absolutely, when you come to soldering chains, and you shouldn't really get any problems. But again, it's down to practice, practice, practice. Um, sorry, please, let me have a next question, please. Yeah. Thank you, let me have our next question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, Laura K is saying the surface of my bench block is marred. What do I need to do to make it smooth again? Okay. The, uh, the bench block, the best way to do it is to get you some various um, grades, some sheets of emery paper, put down onto a piece of glass because glass is going to be perfectly flat. Start off with something like a, I don't know, 600 grit. Get your block face down, up and down, perhaps not in that direction, but perhaps in a 
figure of eight, because that's a very good motion to do, that will get an even amount of wear over the whole um, block. If you push and pull, push and pull, the chances you push and pull, you'll get a bit of um, a, a convex a curve to the top. So always do a figure of eight. And then once you've gone through your, say your 600 grit, go down then to perhaps a thousand grit, do exactly the same and go down a little bit further and so forth. Then you can also then get a nice cloth with some metal um, polish paste onto that, then get your block and go over it. And again, figure of eight, and you should get a pretty much a really nice, or not quite a mirror finish, because it's never gonna be a mirror finish, but you get yourself a really nice um, uh, finish on it. But it may take a while to get all the little dents and dings out of the block. So perhaps start with a 600 grit, or perhaps even a 400 grit, just to go through it, and then go through different stages, ending up with some nice polishing paste, some car uh, polishing paste, all the metal paste, from a car dealer um, or um, an ironmonger's B and Q, whatever you've got, whatever you have got, and that should bring that up really nice. But it will take you a little while. It's not a quick effort. You got to go at it and get all the dents out. Next question, please. please. Mm, Sonia is asking, please advise on a jeweler's kiln. A good investment. Um, depends on what you want to do with it. Um, I have got a kiln myself. It is a Um, it depends what you want to do with it. It's great for enameling. It's great for annealing something really evenly. It's great for doing some lost wax casting. Um, do you know what? It's, it's, it's escaped. And bear with me a second. I will carry on talking to you whilst I um, go along. And it is called a, of course it is, it's a paragon. It's a paragon kiln. It's got a little window in the door so you can actually go through through and see what's happening inside. It's ideal for things like lamp work, beads and so forth. So is it a good investment? <coughs> Only if you're going to use it. I don't use mine enough. I use mine primarily for lost wax casting. Um, and I do take good care of it. It's also got um, a pre-programmed timer upon the bottom as well that you can program the ramping up and the holding and so forth. So for me, yes, it's worth it because I can do my lost wax casting um, completely automated throughout the whole day. But if I wasn't doing lost wax casting, I wouldn't buy one because I would have no need for it. Um, perhaps invest the money into something else because I know they're not cheap. A rolling mill, if you haven't got a rolling mill, I get a rolling mill first over Enamel. a kiln. I want to do some enameling. Enameling. Yeah, yep. absolutely, yeah. If you're going to do enameling, you can do some torch fire enameling. If you have a tripod with a screen up on the top, you can do some torch firing just to get a bit of a practice. But yeah, I have done enameling in a kiln and it does make life a lot easier. So if you want to try and do that, do that. Absolutely brilliant. And also try and get on with a little, little window in the door as well so you can actually see what's happening inside. Thank you, Louise, for giving me the time. <laughs> um, maybe have a next question. Please, yeah, um, Janet is saving for a graver's block. I have mul multiple plastic. Will that work for setting stones in the meantime? Yeah, because you can get your thermo lock within your um, ring clamp, something like that. Um, you can mold it, you can put it into there, get a nice little ball on the end, flatten it, stick your pieces in, you can hold that. And then you can also actually, actually use the, uh, the graver's ball. We've got a little one here. The graver's ball I'm on about. Uh, here we go. So I've got my, look, got my graver's ball here. I just picked it up without the, without the base. So that's my little graver's ball here. And if you, you can still use it with the thermal lock. Say you've got something that's really an unusual design that you want to hold and the little pins that go into the, into the top of this, um, perhaps there isn't the right holes and you can't quite get it right, well then you can always use your thermal lock to make a little two-sided <coughs> clamp to locate on either side here by molding it around the pins, the pins lock in there, then you've got a nice little bit of a jig upon the, uh, the top of this to be able to hold it and you can then move the jaws in and out and you can clamp whatever you want to clamp quite nice and successfully in there. So you can even use your, your thermal lock or your jet set afterwards. I'm not going to put that back in there. 
Uh, but yeah, why not? And they are, they are really good, really good. That's a GRS mini ball or micro ball. Um, yeah, super nice and heavy. Okay, yes, please, sorry. I just, yes. so Lynn has just mentioned that she has a friend who does a lot of enameling who says not to look through the window. Apparently it's bad for your eyes and it's better to open the door. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It is better to open the door, yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You can always wear your glasses, but yeah, I totally agree with them. Mm. Yeah, okay, yeah. super, thank you for that. Better to look into the whole kiln rather than yeah. a tiny spot. Mm, but, but then my argument would be then, if as soon as you open the door, the temperature comes right down. But is it better to save your eyes? I expect it would be. Yeah, I mean, you'd probably <laughs> sacrifice yours, wouldn't you, for the piece, but that's just you, your nuts. Let's face it. <laughs> yeah, um, okay, I stand corrected, said the man in the orthopaedic shoes. Things like that. Yes, yeah. okay, next one, please, Louise. Um, right, do you buy stock metal? <laughs> do you buy stock metal by bulk when the price goes down or by the job? Um, I do both, really. I think if the price goes down, is that the lowest price it's going to go down to? Who knows? Um, what I try and do is that I do have a big box full of all scrap. And what I do tend to do is when the price goes up, and I'm looking at the price of a job, and look at the price per gram, and you think, my goodness me, I'm gonna do what I can, because I'm not paying that. And if I got a quiet half an hour, an hour, one afternoon, Friday afternoon, whatever, I would then get my box of scrap, and I would melt it down, I would roll out some sheet, or draw some wire down, something like that, so then we can then produce some sheets far, far cheaper. <coughs> so, yeah, if you think the silver has dropped to the lowest it's, it is going to go, by all means, buy in bulk, buy some nice, perhaps two millimeter thick sheets, three millimeter thick wire, so then you can use your rolling mill to reduce it. But then what happens then in a week or so's time, it's dropped again, and you think, I've just spent all that money on that, and I thought that was the lowest. So if you could do that, you'd make millions on the stock exchange, knowing when it's gonna become the lowest, and you'd, what would you, you buy low, sell high, yeah, that's the best way to do it. But no, but you always keep your, your scraps and I've got an assortment box full of all bits and pieces, stuff that we buy in and I would use that whenever I can. Uh, if I'm doing a nice project for at the bench or, or doing something nice, well, then I'd always get some fresh metal. And if I didn't have it there and then, I'd have to go and buy it. So it's just one of those things. Okay, uh, can we have a, a quick next question, please? It's, time is up, it's just after five o'clock. We'll do a few more minutes, I think, there's about one or two more questions, if that's okay. Yeah, uh, before we go any further, um, we have emailed the focus group. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'm wondering whether they've gone into people's junk or spam, because I think we've had about three acknowledgements out of the 10. Not, okay. So either people are just not that interesting <laughs> anyone who, oh no or, okay, okay yeah check check your your, your spam folders yes so your junk yeah folders. so everybody has been emailed please if you've received an email from louise saying that you're one of our 10 um, in the focus group please just email us back acknowledge that because we just want to make sure i think that it's we gone do. into people's because uh, one one lady has said i only saw it because i checked my spam okay so and when do you send them out Friday. Friday last Friday, week. Friday, yeah, wasn't it? Okay, so all weekends so, yeah. it's been sat there in your spam folder, not knowing. So yeah, check your spam or your deleted folders because an email went out Friday afternoon. It's about half past four, five o'clock, um, four o'clock. It was yeah, thereabouts. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah. UK time. So um, just double check if you have received it and you're one of our ten. Please <laughs> reply back. Because if you don't reply back, we may just have to then select somebody else. We do need 10 people. Well, we'll give it a week. We won't just Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Absolutely, yeah. 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 At it's, least. It's, it's, it's at least. So it's still in production. The course is in production still at the moment. We're doing some editing for that all the time. I can't believe how much and how long I can talk over something so, so simple. Mm. I think I've done like a 25-minute film just on simply soaring forwards. But it's bench essentials, isn't it? It's basically getting you to do oh the essentials, gosh, but getting yeah. them to getting you to do them really, really well. Yes. So and, and the then, reason why you're doing it. Yeah, mm. and then you move on from that. Yeah. But yes. you're excellent at what you need to do to move on. Yes. So it's yeah. 
Yes. It's a very so when, so when, thing. once you understand how to saw, when mm -hmm. you come to do the next part, it's not the films aren't going to be as long, and it's going to be a little bit easier for you because you actually understand then, don't you? Yeah. So yeah, you may, you may want to resend. What email would I sent them from Louise at andrewberry dot go dot uk or dot yes. com. Dot co uk wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So Louise, Louise at andrewberry dot co uk. Yeah. So just double check that out, please. Mm. Okay, so uh, may I have one more question then, please, Louise? Yeah. Um, um, wouldn't you use hard or extra hard solder on that bezel joint? Oh, oh. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, okay, yes. Yeah, so, so going yeah. back to that, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily use extra hard. Uh, that, oh, that's, that's really very near the melting point. So, yes, you would use hard solder. Then you'd use another solder when you solder the bezel onto the back plate. But if you think about it, the back plate is going to be bigger than the bezel and it's very easy to overheat that bezel because you want the solder to solder onto the back plate and even though if the, the solder of the back plate may be perhaps medium the heat of that bezel may be slightly hotter that will just cause that other bit of solder to melt a fraction and it's only got to go jelly like and it'll just pull away or perhaps the, the bezel may just separate slightly, maybe under tension, something like that, um, and that would be the case. So even though you use different melting point solder, there's always a chance that the bezel is going to overheat and the solder is going to melt. Next question, last question I think Louise. Have yes? you ever put up a booth or tent at a horse show? Natalia's partner swears that they saw you at one. No. no. The horse show? No. No, Spotted. no, and I've never done. Um, Jason's put up his booth at um, um, car shows with his yeah. with his Jay's Wax. Mm. No, I've never had a booth. I've never put. I've never been to a horse show. I mean, no, I've never You've done a show. Got a double then. I have a double. One of you is quite enough. <laughs> um, um, oh, Amco says dot com. Okay, fab. So yeah, Louise at Andrewberry dot com. It's come from. Okay. Okay, we'll send them out again. Okay. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. <laughs> All right, next question. Last a final question for the afternoon, please, Louise. Silver Pearls. I have not landed on my favourite thing to make. I'm all over the board. Should I stick to making, for example, making rings or whatever only until I've landed on my favourite thing to do? Hmm. What would you think? I think you have, I think you have. May, I don't know, the thing is this, I, personally, I think if I was starting, I would, and I do this a lot with everything, I kind of like do something and then get good at it and then don't want to do anything else, not because I'm frightened, mm. just because I fall into a trap of doing something. So I think it's good to kind of force yourself to, to do other things. Mm. And that's what I'm doing as I'm getting older instead of just... Okay. Sticking yeah. to the same thing and pushing myself more and more out of my comfort zone. Hmm. Okay. But I suppose if you if you have a particular if you're trying to find whether I like making rings or pendants or brooches or necklaces, I, I don't personally think you can stick to that one thing because it, it, people may not want. Say you think, oh my god, I love pendants. Pendants are my main thing. They may not sell as well, perhaps. Mm. So I think you've got to be able to apply your techniques to things like rings and understand how to make ring shanks um, and how to make bezels for rings. And then by making bezels, you can start making them into pendants and then you can make them into brooches. And I think you should try and get a wide breadth of knowledge on how to make everything because perhaps, perhaps you may find the brooches will come back and then you think, my gosh, I can't make brooches. I, I, I love making rings, but I don't like making brooches. Well. You're going to have to start making brooches because that's what is selling at the moment. So I think you've really got to go with what is perhaps sellable. And maybe you is won't it? have a favourite thing. Maybe you'll just like making everything yeah. equally. Maybe you'll just... Mm. Or perhaps you'll, perhaps you'll find a particular technique that you love doing. Mm. And you can apply that technique to all the different styles of jewellery perhaps. Yeah, because yeah, or... there's new ways of doing or different ways of doing yeah. most things, aren't there? So, yeah. 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 And, if you, and if you like making brooches, what sort of things... Do you like making with the brooches and can you then use those particular techniques from brooches and try and translate that into a ring or a pendant what was that thing we saw we went to that 
fair in City Hall last year yes. and the lady who did the... Was it Fine Enamel? Yes. And that's all she did? Yes, just but Fine Enamel. But she was amazing at it, wasn't she? Oh she my was gosh, just, yeah. We were there for ages. And, yeah, and chalking and, her, um, we? Yeah, but that's all she did. But it was brilliant. But that was a technique, wasn't it? Yeah. Technique, and yeah. she applied it across. But that's what she loved, and that's yes. what she did. I suppose, yeah. Mm. Mm. So wow. maybe yeah. think about techniques rather than pieces, and then you might find your thing that you love. Yeah, an actual mm. technique, yeah. Which is yeah. what you pretty good. much said, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's good, good. Mm. Oh, that's nice on that. I like yeah. that. More than nice. Mm. Go on, have one more question. I you need to say that. Come on, last, the last, this is, this is, this is the last question now. Is there, an, um, is there an At The Bench Facebook group? Scrap over engineering? Yes, there is. Louisa, push the button now to get a little post Facebook out there. Facebook group. Oh, Facebook group. group. Oh, There's sorry. A Facebook There's a Facebook page. page. That Louisa will just quickly post up now. And what that's, I, no, I haven't got that. You just, you've got the, the ring. Remember us, I talked about the ring? Oh, that thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That. <laughs> I mean, oh, just no, that. I mean that, that thing, that button, that, not that, that, not that thing. thing. That button, that so, button you're making yes, me press. When we have our <laughs> 10 for our focus group for our online classes, yes, we will then have a private Facebook group, yes. But in the meantime, click the little link down there. That will take you to the At The Bench Facebook page. And check your spam. Check your spam, because you might have an email sat in your spam. Yes. Your junk. Please, 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 please. I'll please. resend them all, but check. Absolutely. Last question, please, Louise. Um, there was a bit of a debate about, I'm not going to open that map because you'll talk about it for hours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, you see, you've done it again, haven't you? <laughs> um, oh, golly. It's Louise's I, birthday. Oh, it's my birthday. Back. Back. I've only worked with silver, but this is Hayley. I've only worked with silver, but want to work with 14 karat gold. What is the transition like? It's pretty good. It's, I don't think there's an awful lot of difference. You can still use the same flux. You should be able to use the same tools as well. Nothing particularly different. You do have to obviously make sure that you measure twice and cut once. Um, that's always very important. Always make sure that you have wrong camera, something underneath, oh, you can just about see me moving it. Always make sure that you have, you see now, a tray or something underneath your peg so you catch all the lemel. And especially when you use things like gold, it's more important now to catch the lemel, the filings that comes off your peg than ever and put that to one side and a little, like an old film canister or a little container to save everything. Obviously you need the proper solder, your 14 karat solder, so you can still get easy, medium and hard. Same acid, same flux, same everything, same torch, just got to take a lot more care when it comes to gold. I think that's it. Yep. And don't be too disappointed if you didn't make the focus group 10 because we are going to be sending out some nice discounts for everybody yes. who applied for the focus group. Uh, what was I supposed to say then? Yes, of course you can. Yes, yes, no worries at all. And yeah, and also I think we do have, have a special guest on our focus group, don't we? Do we? Do we? I think, I think, I think Louise is going to be on the focus group as well and, and she'll be I haven't taken up a space though, I will no, no. say that. So I, we had 10. I'm Louise going to be an extra gonna, albatross. Lu right <laughs> Louise is going to be the extra. She's going to be the 11th person. I just hope I'm not the dunce of the class. She's not there to check up or anything like that. She's purely there just to go through it with you guys, just so you, you know um, and she knows what's going on. But then I'm not going to get any extra help or any extra... Oh my gosh, no. Oh, that's, that's Jason and she... <laughs> You won't get any help from me. And, don't, and for goodness sake, don't do it Jason's way. You'd be doing it all wrong. <laughs> don't be horrible. <laughs> okay, so everybody, thank you all very much for coming on this afternoon. It's nice to be back up here in this workshop. It's nice and quiet. You get no interruptions. Um, don't forget, it is Louise's birthday this coming Saturday. So happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Louise. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. <laughs> You'll get it better on the day. It's all right. <laughs> I look forward to that. All right. So I, th I think somebody said, am I going to be buying jewellery? Would I buy jewellery at that sort of exorbitant cost? No, mind joking. <laughs> so, all right, so the question answer is over. Quickly now before you go, the beginning of the question answer, I said we had this ring. 
Um, I want to know, this is a silver band that I have made up. I want to know how much you would pay for a sterling silver hand hammered hand made ring like this. The reason why I'm asking is that we're doing two films on At The Bench because somebody on a Facebook group said how much she was going to charge. She said, is that the right amount? And everybody just laid into her, said, that's ridiculous, you can't charge that. Asked like $10, I wouldn't pay more than that. Someone said, oh, I'll pay $250. And there was lots of reasons. So it's a very simple question. I don't want you to say, oh, babe, depends on who made it, depends upon the time it's taken, it depends on this. No, it is a simple sterling silver, not made in anywhere, it's made in the UK, it's made, you have personally made it, you have got this, or in theory then, how much would you buy a ring like that for? And we're going to be going through the costings on a film on At The Bench, which is coming out later on this week. Louise has put up the um, post to go to Facebook. Just leave a comment, just say $10, 10 pounds, 10 Australian dollars, $50. You don't have to give me an explanation. If you want to, you can do. It's not hallmarked, just stamped 925. So how much would you pay for it as how a much, customer? Okay, sorry. Yes. How much would you pay for it? Mm, not necessarily. Yeah, because, how much would you pay? Yeah. How much would you pay for it? Because how much you charge... It's a very difficult question to ask somebody in the jewellery manufacturer industry yes. or hobbyist, yes, isn't because it? because everyone knows really how long it takes. Mm. That, that ring took me 13 minutes, 50 seconds, from picking up the metal to actually going dinner, it's done. But that's not beside that's beside the point. I want to know how much you would pay for it. I don't want to know how much you would charge, but how much you would pay for it. You'd be better off asking people outside of the industry, wouldn't you? Yes, it would be. Mm. Anyway, next, uh, <laughs> the next question, next thing I want you to do is that we've got a little competition going on uh, where you can win this. This is The Art of Stamping by Mattia Chemene, uh, a brilliant, brilliant book. You've got a chance of winning this, not this book, this book's mine. You know, having this book, plus there's a bit of a, a dent on the corner there where it was dropped. Uh, the delivery man dropped it, but you can win a brand new copy of this book, The Art of Stamping. It is an absolute gorgeous, gorgeous book. I rave about it. It's absolutely brilliant. If you want a chance of winning this particular, no, it's not, the book, brand new book. I had a chat with Tim McCreed. He said he will ship one book to anywhere around the world should you happen to win. And if you want to win a chance of winning that, just Oops. click. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong link. Okay. Bye bye. Louise is going to pop that into the <laughs> just into the. Uh, that's that the one now. We pressed it. Right. Okay. So that's the YouTube film. Go to YouTube. On the YouTube film, there's a link. You've got to answer one simple question. Fill out your information. You can opt out of emails. Whatever you want to do. It's type two, but then you will have a chance of winning a copy of that book. I think that runs until the end of September. So you've got about another two weeks to go. That is it. Harper 20 is what I would pay and what I would charge. Customers are glad to pay as well. Great, thank you for that, but just pop that on the Facebook post, not necessarily, thank you Louise, not on the chat because nobody knows what you're on about when they come back to watch the chat on YouTube. So thank you very much for everybody who has come on this afternoon. It's been another blast again. Um, yeah, we're gonna be back here again next week after Louise's birthday, which is on Saturday. <laughs> uh, Mariah, you're a little bit late now to join the questions. Please, before I come and get your chance for your questions to be answered, please come on on next 21st of September and ask the question nice and early. Maybe with a chance of having your question answered. And if you haven't got your question answered, I do apologize. There's only so much time that we can do this for. Perhaps we should do this for a bit longer every month, perhaps give a chance to everybody to come on and have their mm. questions answered. Anyway, we'll have a chat. Everybody, say goodbye to Louise. Wish her a happy birthday. Goodbye. Thank you all so much for the happy birthdays. <laughs> we will then we'll see you next Monday on the 21st of September. It's 21st, I think it's the 14th today. David, thank you very much for your kind words. Really do appreciate it. Yes, Monday, give Louise time to recover from her birthday. We had planned on going away, but we've got a bit of a lockdown happening here in our, in our country, in our borough we're not allowed out of the borough so we can't go away for louise's birthday but i have promised her a nice trip somewhere 
once the lockdown is the finished. The garden, is it? The garden. No, I thought Birmingham, we can go to Birmingham. We're, we're locked down. We're no, but after, after, after oh, the right. lockdown. <laughs> All right, everyone. When's Andrews is... Um, it's it's um, March. March. It's March. March, March sometimes. Oh, good God, but it was St. Patrick's Day. 17th of March. That's enough. Everyone, you've got the slide? Got the, do you have the slide? Shall we in, in slide in oh, position? Oh, it's my <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thank you all for watching. We will see you all very, very shortly next week, 4 p.m., 21st of September. Take care. Have a lovely week. Bye for now.